Jim, our next question sent to Corny Drive Through at gmail.com from Mark Hole with Odessa Steps Magazine. And also a man who sent me a fine Wendy's gift card for Christmas and a card, and I haven't got out to, to use it yet, but I'm going to. We are coming up on the anniversary of the Midnight Express winning the NWA World Tag Team titles from the Rock and Roll Express on the Superstars on the Superstation show. February 2nd, baby. 1986. Since the topic hasn't been discussed on the show recently, apart maybe from David Crockett's commentary, I was wondering if we could, I, he left out a word or two here, if we could, I guess, show some history or talk about some history on this monumental event for Jim Dennis and Bobby. Here are the questions. When did the Midnight Express learn from Dusty they were winning the belts? Presumably, Jim knew they would win them eventually once arriving in Jim Crockett promotions. But when did you know? Before the Rock and Roll Express won them back at Starcade, A week or two before? Question two, did Jim have any input on the finish or was it all Dusty? And question three, just how groggy was Bobby really during the locker room <laughs> interview when he was selling the racket shop? There's a picture that they took that uh, some uh, whoever the photographer was, I don't think it was Lynn McAllister because that was before he started. It may have been, God, what was his name? Woody Smith from Charlotte or whatever, but a picture is circulated. Obviously, Bobby had been whacked with the racket in the finish and he was supposed to be pretty much out of it. And... So we come back in the locker room after the match and for the post-match interview, we're the new champions, right? And we sit Bobby in a chair and he's selling like he's still halfway knocked out and goofy. And so the picture that went everywhere is Dennis standing there holding the belts and me pointing to the camera and saying whatever the fuck I was saying. And Bobby's sitting there to look like he nodded off. <laughs> With his head, heads over to the side in the chair. Uh, no, we didn't know... That was February 2nd, 1986. We didn't know the week after Starcade, which was Thanksgiving of the previous year, um, that we were going to win them. We knew when we went into Jim Crockett Promotions because the same night or the same week that uh, that we started, and, and we've talked about this at the Atlanta end when there were still the Atlanta office open and the Charlotte office, the Rock and Roll Express beat the Russians for the World Tag Team title on Crockett's syndicated television in the Carolinas. And the deal was the Rock and Roll were going to be based out of the Carolinas and the Midnight in Georgia to keep us apart for six months. That's what Dusty had said. So it would not only give us time to get over, but the Rock and Roll were already over from beating the Russians. That was instantly smashed them over the first night, but then they can have the rematches and get all the money out of that and, you know, people know more about the rock and roll. So we're going to keep that apart for six months. So they're the champions. So, you know, we knew that that was going to happen. Then when they dropped them and did the switch with, um, oh, God damn it. It was only an iron, right? Uh, I thought it was the Russians, actually. Oh, no, it was the Russians and they won them back because then they had next year. That's right. Only an iron wrestled them in Starcade 86. Yes. But the point is they dropped them back to the Russians so that they could get the big pop by winning them back at Starcade. But we had not even started wrestling the rock and roll in any matches until around about the time of Starcade. And that's when Dusty started booking the midnight in the first, some of the first Carolina's Crockett towns that we'd go into. And we'd go in and either have a non-title match with them, or it might be a title match and we'd get disqualified or whatever. Just give the people a little taste. Because I remember the first time we went to Richmond, Virginia, and I believe it was somewhere in late November of 1985, and wrestled a Rock and Roll Express for the tag team title. The house was $13,000. Richmond was on its ass. We went back after we'd shot the angle on television after the Rock and Roll Midnight program had started in late January, two months later, and we did $88,000. That was the all-time Richmond record for that time. And the next month, we would beat it again and do over 100. 
But anyway, so the point is, we were kept apart for a while. Then they put us together in some matches in a few of the towns just for the people to get a little taste. And then I would say, I can't remember the specific place and date since we weren't in the locker room with Dusty every single night because a lot of times the babyface locker rooms were separate. It was probably either at Atlanta TV or at the syndicated television that we did a week or two before the Omni show. That would have been when Dusty would have told us because we had to know because what was happening was the, the the match was in the Omni on February 2nd, but the entire Omni show was being videotaped and it was going to air the following Friday night on TBS as the first live primetime wrestling special ever on TBS, Superstars on the Superstation. And we'd started doing promos for it and the interviews for it. It's going to be Superstars on a Superstation, baby. So since we were one of the feature matches, Dusty did tell us ahead of time, here's where we're going to pull the trigger, baby. Here's where we're going to do it. You guys win the titles. Okay, so, I mean, you know, we were expecting because we never thought that we were going to have an angle with the Rock and Roll Express not involving the World Tag Team title because Dusty had planned for that to be his top tag team program. And we never planned for it to be a program with the rock and roll express where we would never actually win the belts from him uh, from them, because that would have been insane to have a whole program and never the heels never win the belts. That was, that was what we spent a career doing with them. We beat them for the belts, hold them long enough till the people didn't think they could ever get them back and then put the belts back on them. That's, you know, the, the money for the baby faces, especially in Southern wrestling was the chase was achieving the goal. And then you didn't want them to get too complacent because if the baby faces were champions for too long, you had no heat. But it's so, it, but it was, you know, it was a, the week or two before whatever. And in talking about, you know, it was going to be one of the featured matches on the superstars on Superstation special. And the finish he asked about was completely dust. I was in no way to the point yet where Dusty was asking my opinion on any of the finishes. We'd been there for seven months at that point. I was happy to be there and we did whatever Dusty said to do. And uh, on that one, the only, I wish I'd have brought my whacking racket rather than the sparkly racket that would have made a noise. But since I didn't use it, Dennis did anyway. And Dennis didn't like the whack. He liked to hit a guy straight over the back of the head. And he was good enough with it. You could work it anyway. As, and and that was the day we've mentioned. I don't know why they took this chance that they booked this this way, but besides money, on February 2nd, there were two afternoon shows that Jim Crockett was running. One was in Charlotte at the Coliseum with the Midnight versus the Rock and Roll in the main event for the World Tag Team title right after the angle we had done where we dropped Ricky Morton's throat on top and they picked him up and dropped him and I had the racket and he dropped throat first on the racket and spit up blood and you know we threatened his career may be over that was the first big angle and so they put us in the main event in Charlotte and the second afternoon show was in Hamilton Ontario because it was the first big Mosca mania show that Angelo Mosca was running to opposed the Tunnies in Toronto that had gone with the WWF. And that was where Flair and Dusty and the Road Warriors were. And that show did 10,000 people and $100,000 or whatever the fuck it was. And the show that we had in Charlotte sold out. It was the first legitimate clean sellout for wrestling in the Charlotte Coliseum since Flair and Blackjack Mulligan in 1978. And we did it without Flair, Dusty, and Road Warriors on the card. So Crockett had grossed over $200,000 and sold 22,000, 23,000 tickets that afternoon between those two shows, because we had 12,000 in Charlotte, they had 10,000 in Hamilton. And then they took, Crockett got a prize. This was before Crockett had even bought his jet. I'm pretty sure they got a chartered jet to bring them back from Hamilton to Atlanta 
And me and Bobby and Dennis and a couple of the other people that were on the Charlotte afternoon card, it wasn't a big card, that that were on the Omni show also, we had to finish at 4 o'clock, jump in the car, and drive 240 miles to Atlanta. And the 8 o'clock bell time, we got to Atlanta, and in the locker room, the show was already going on. And so we, real quick, boned up on what finish we were doing that in that particular match and by then it was time to go out and do it so we had two different matches with the rock and roll express that day in front of a total of almost 20,000 people because the omni house was 7,000 fans paid $60,000 even though they knew they were going to see it on tv the following friday and back then if you knew you were going to see something on television, you didn't buy a ticket to see it live. TV was the most poorly attended wrestling show of all because you knew you could see it on TV. And Crockett, uh, on three shows in a 12-hour period, sold 30,000 tickets and grossed uh, $270,000. And we all barely made the goddamn TBS primetime network special because. The biggest stars were in fucking Canada until 4.30. And we were driving down I-85 after selling that goddamn some bitch out, as Ricky Morton would say, for the first time in eight years. What a day!